In this series, I've been exploring the red centre of Australia. The Northern Territory is an amazing place and full of surprises. Wow, this came out of the blue. I was driving along and the sky is completely blue over there. That's where I've come from. And if I spin it around, you can see behind me, it's red. There's a sandstorm coming through. So I think the safest thing to do is just to sit here and let it pass. Damn these flies, they're vicious bastards. So that sandstorm passed without incident. So I'm now headed towards Alice Springs. Now, it's going to take me from here, it's going to take me four hours of driving. It's 455 kilometers away. And it's now uh, one o'clock. Yes, this is it, this is it. Okay, I want to show you something really cool that I came across a few years ago when I was this way last. I reckon this is really, really cool. I won't tell you what it is just yet. But we are about 100 k's south of Alice Springs. Okay, it is stinking hot. It's uh, about 36 degrees. So, I'm not going to reveal where, where we are yet. There is a gate. You'll see what it is when we get up to there, but uh, this is basically just to satisfy my uh, one of my other interests. I've got many interests. This is one of them. I look at the surrounding countryside. Look at that mountain range over there. Beautiful. It's only a short walk. Ah, oh, it's raining. Look at that. Just my luck. But well, we're almost there. But hopefully, hopefully the rain will pass. It does, only looks like a small cloud. Okay, so as I said, I discovered this place quite by accident a number of years ago, just by going down a dirt road and having a look at what's there. And uh, now I'm really, really keen to show you what this is. This is a meteorite crater. This is Henbury meteorite crater. It's about 140 kilometers south of Alice Springs. Got a lot of rain coming my way. Look at that. Oh dear. Well, what can I do about that? Not much. I'm going to get wet. So this, uh, this impact crater, this is only one of 12. Look at the clouds up overhead. It's actually moving quite quick, so this rain should pass in a couple of minutes. Oh, okay, lots of rain coming. <sighs> okay, so I've actually been drenched. Uh, it got quite windy, and the rain was pretty much horizontal for a while there. And I scrambled down the side of the, the crater and I'm hiding in some bushes here, and that helped. And uh, I think it's all past. Let's go back and have a look. Uh, 
Well, oh, well, there you go. There's a rainbow. And I'm sopping wet. So, this is, let's <laughs> start the story again. This is uh, Henbury Meteorite Crater. In fact, this is one of 12 impact craters in this area. So what happened was 4,700 years ago, a meteorite weighing several tons accelerated up to 40,000 kilometers per hour as it entered the atmosphere and it broke up before it hit the crust into 12 pieces. And each one of these impact craters is where the meteorite landed. There's one over here. And there's a large one over here. And there's more around as we walk around, this entire valley is filled with impact craters. You can see the rain passing off to the right there. So just imagine the size of the impact when this meteorite, which cons consisted of 90% uh, iron, 8% uh, nickel and the rest other minerals, it was very, very heavy. It slammed into the ground in 12 pieces and must have caused a huge uh, amount of debris being thrown up from the ground. And in fact, the ground is still warm. <laughs> Beautiful view though, look at that. Now it would be really, really cool to find a chunk of meteorite. But uh, I believe that pretty much all the meteorite fragments have been located. Well, they can't be for sure, but nobody's finding any more. So they've recovered, I think, 500 kilograms of meteorite fragments. And that's not counting the ones that people have come and taken for themselves over, over the years. And uh, it's actually illegal to take uh, meteorite fragments from here if you find any. So I'm not going to bother. I doubt that there's any left because uh, this has been here for 4,700 years and people have probably been coming here for a good 50, 60 years. So uh, I doubt there's anything left. This is the inside of the crater. It's really challenging to film here because I'm covered in flies. I can't stay still for two seconds because uh, the flies keep on landing on me. And including the hand that I'm holding the camera with, I need one hand free to swap them away and I keep swapping hands. It's difficult to film. Okay, I think it's time to head back to the car. Well, now that I'm walking away from the meteorite crater, there is a significant fewer number of flies. I think the flies are the, the guardians of the crater. We're about uh, 80 kilometers south of Alice Springs and just driving through the James Ranges and they are absolutely spectacular. So finally I've made it into Alice Springs. The sun is about to set. We've got an electrical storm happening uh, over there and it's moving slowly this way. So as nice as that sunset is, I'm not going to camp. I'm going to get a room for the night because I have no desire to go camping in a tropical storm. So that's it for today and tomorrow I've got something very special planned. So until then, see you tomorrow. Good morning. I have just left Alice Springs and I'm heading due west. This is the Larapinda Drive and surrounding me is the beautiful West McDonnell Ranges. You've got the exposed red rock up the top. 
You've got the pale yellow spinifex and then the green trees down the bottom. Absolutely beautiful. Typical of the countryside around these parts. It's a beautiful day. I'm heading off to a place called Fink Gorge National Park. Fink Gorge National Park is a new destination for me. I've never been there before and so I'm really looking forward to it. I got carried away at looking at the scenery and didn't realise I'd reached the turn off. Buono momento, por favore. Quick, I need to plug in the mic and put my hat on. <sighs> There's a bunch of indigenous kids playing in the, on the river. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we've finally made it to Fink Gorge National Park. It's four wheel drive track only. So we're going to put the car into four wheel drive. There we go. Right, I'm really keen to see this. I've uh, read a little bit about what we're about to see and uh, it should be pretty cool. Oh, the corrugations. So this is Fink Gorge National Park and what I really wanted to see is the Fink River. Now I'm standing in the dry riverbed here. There's a bit of water over there and this is really the start of the National Park so we're going to progress further down. It's just a four-wheel drive track only but the reason I wanted to see the Fink River so much is it is the oldest river in the world. Now, just to give you a, an idea of how old it is, I've got a list here of the oldest, the top 10 oldest rivers. I'm going to read out a few of them. So let's go from, from the bottom up. Uh, the Ohio River, 2.5 to 3 million years old. Uh, we've got the Amazon, 11.8 million years old. We've got the the Thames, 5.8, no, sorry, the Thames is 58 million years old, so that's pretty ancient. We've got the Nile, 65 to 75 million years old. We've got the Colorado River, which carved out the, the Grand Canyon, that is 75 million years old. We've got, what else is here that's interesting? And then we've got, at the very top, the Fink River, 350 to 400 million years old. So, the way that they know how old it is, is by looking at the geology surrounding the river. So we've got these flat bits here, and these are called meanders. And meanders only form in special circumstances and by looking at the rest of the geology they can work out exactly when the river started flowing through these flat bits and carving it up. So let's go further into the park and we can have a look at the rest of the Fink River. The start of the National Park is quite an easy drive along a corrugated dirt track. The corrugations are generally not too bad. The scenery is spectacular. Okay, I'm now about halfway through the National Park and before I go on, I've stopped in this riverbed here because I need to adjust this. Uh, this has come loose and that's going to bother me. So I need to get under there and uh, fix that up. 
otherwise I'm going to have a spotlight fall off. So get some tools. From memory, that is either a 17 or a 19. Let's try a 19. I need a 19 socket. I've tightened that as well as I could. That, and I'll put a, a socket under there and I tighten that. Oh, there we go. Found the socket. <laughs> All right. So hopefully it doesn't feel terribly strong. So I'm going to have to check that every now and then. Considering the billions of corrugations I've done on this trip, that was the first repair I had to do and that was very simple. The further I head into the park, the more spectacular the scenery becomes. The track at times winds through the dry creek bed of the Fink River. It has become soft and sandy but it looks like a really, really pretty place. Let's get out and have a look. What a beautiful, tranquil spot. It's very, really, very soft sand. This looks like a camping spot. That is perfect, look at that. There's a fire pit that someone's left there. Beautiful rusting red rocks of the uh, canyon wall. This is absolutely idyllic. Okay, so up ahead, this is the start of the Fink Gorge National Park. And it looks like the drive on the riverbed is extremely soft sand. So I'm going to have to lower the tyres and put it into low range. Now, apart from being the oldest river on the planet, there's another thing that's interesting about the Fink River. Now, pretty much every river has one of two types of destinations. They either all run into the ocean or they run into another river which then runs into the ocean. There's two exceptions that I know of. There's the Okavango River, which starts, I think, in Namibia and then goes through Angola and eventually to the Okavango Delta and flows out onto the Kalahari and just evaporates into the desert. And the other one is the Fink River. Now, the Fink River uh, makes its way towards Lake Eyre and if there's enough water flowing through it, when there's a torrential downpour and a lot of water coming this way, it, that water will eventually make it to Lake Eyre where it will evaporate. Or, um, most of the time, it just evaporates before it even gets to Lake Eyre. The length of the river is about 850 kilometers. It snakes its way from the McDonnell Ranges, which is pretty much just behind me, all the way through down into South Australia and off to Lake Eyre. So it is really an ancient landscape, as is so much of Australia. We really do have a very, very stable geology and therefore the landscape hasn't changed in a very, very long time. Hundreds and hundreds of millions of years.
the corrugations. <laughs> Careful here, very uneven surface. The track winds its way along a rocky riverbed. Luckily today it's mostly dry, but you can see the markers indicating where the track is when it's full of water. Okay, so the sun is shining from overhead, which means when I look at the screen on the camera, everything looks black, looks silhouetted. So I don't know if you can actually make out those rock walls behind me, but in case you can, look at that. That's like something out of Death Valley. Beautiful. This really is an incredible place. Australia has such a wide range of scenery. The place that I'm driving through now is like I've seen in, uh, in Death Valley, for example, in America. Uh, canyons, gorgeous. Uh, we've got little bits of, of the Grand Canyon, little bits of Death Valley. Uh, little bits of deserts, uh, all sorts of things. It's just such a, um, a wide range of different types of scenery from all around the world that occur in Australia and a lot of uh, landscapes that don't occur anywhere else of course. Yeah, amazing, amazing place. I don't know how much of the colour of the rocks you can see in the video because in real life they are dark dark red really really dark red and beautiful uh, but because of the, the way that the sun is shining is directly overhead uh, it's also overcast it's, I think it's making everything look really dark on the video uh, I'll see once I review the footage and uh, it might turn out okay I'm not sure but this is absolutely spectacular in real life. Okay, I've just caught my first sight of a red cabbage palm. There's one directly in front of us. Right up there. And there's another one over there. Apparently this one tiny valley contains something like 3,000 of them and they are the only ones that, uh, that are on the planet. Nowhere else does this grow. I'm just driving along the bottom of the, the uh, riverbed here is really, really soft sand and quite rocky. There's some cabbage palms over there and uh, this guy walks my way well, uh, and he's got this old, old old lady on his arm and she looks like she's about 90 and he's, uh, he's obviously taken his mother to see the, the cabbage palms and I, I quickly have a chat to them as, as they're walking up past the car and uh, she explains that back in 1952 they, uh, they walked uh, something like 50 kilometers when they broke down back to the ranger's hut and they've got some memories of this place and it is <laughs> but it was really nice that the guy was taking his, his old um, mother to see this, this place. Um, I was very surprised, because she looked very, very old, and I was very surprised that uh, she was walking with a, walk, with, a, with a cane, with a walking stick. But uh, she was out there doing it, which is great. <sighs> wow, I hope that I can 
do this sort of stuff when I'm 90. So I'm just negotiating the, uh, the valley floor here with all these rocks beside me. Oh, what a place. Really difficult to get to. But so worth it. I mean, just look at that. And there, nestled amongst the, the walls are the cabbage palms. The type of rock, this looks exactly like the same type of rock that Uluru is, is made out of. A sedimentary sandstone type rock called Arcos. The same kind of patterning in the rock the same texture, the same colour. So these, uh, these palms, this is the only place in the planet that they grow in this valley. And there's 3,800 of them. And that's it. So they are highly, highly endangered. And they're surviving. So quite appropriately, this is this is known as Palm Valley. Incidentally, the Fink River, which occasionally flows through here, in the uh, native indigenous language, it's known as Larapinta, and Larapinta means salt river. It is stinking hot. It's probably about 36 degrees. And uh, yeah, sweating it away. <laughs> Here it is up close, a red cabbage palm. The leaves feel like banana leaf. Here we go, here's a whole lot more. It, uh, it really is interesting that this doesn't grow anywhere outside this one specific valley, anywhere on the planet. Now, how it got here is a mystery. And why only here? Well, that's, that's another mystery. One possible explanation is maybe some bird long ago dropped a seed of a similar species of palm and then over a great length of time, maybe millions of years, the, uh, the red cabbage palm evolved into what it is now and therefore it's, it's different to anything else on the planet. Well, that's just a hypothesis because I don't know. Well, this is my last day in the Northern Territory and tomorrow morning I'm heading back back home to Sydney and it's going to be four to five long days of driving this uh, walkway that I'm walking on is pretty cool very easy to walk on
tranquilness and serenity of this place has put me in a philosophical state of mind. Well, the uh, last 11 days have been go, go, go for me. Rushing from one place to another, just trying to, to film everything that I wanted to film. It's been really nice, I really enjoyed it. And uh, now it's time for me to get back to reality and go home. <laughs> but uh, it's just nice to sit on a rock in the middle of nowhere. This is literally the middle of nowhere in the middle of Australia, hundreds of kilometers away from civilization. No trace of humanity anywhere, apart from the camera that I'm holding. But apart from that, no trace of humanity, no rubbish, just this beautiful, rugged country. And the animal noises, occasionally there's a snake, or an emu, a kangaroo, or a wild horse, or a lizard, and I've seen a whole bunch of things this, um, over these past few days. It's been really great. And as always, when I have time to sit down in, in nature like this and just contemplate on my surroundings and I, I realize how lucky I am to, to be able to get to do this and to actually sit here and talk to you about this and to come on these, uh, these trips. There's, there's a lot of people that, oh, there's a huge amount of people that don't come on these sorts of trips because they don't have four-wheel drives, they're not into this sort of thing. And so they're really missing out. And then there, there are the people that do have four-wheel drives and they do come to these places, but they might not get the full experience because they come in large groups and uh, you know, kids screaming and whatever. Um, and that, there's nothing wrong with that, you know, you've got to have, spend time with your kids. But then there are other people that come to these places and, like myself, sit down and just really immerse yourself in the environment and admire it and take the time to feel that one with the place. And then you can really develop a bond with the place and special memories of, of the place and, and of what it feels like to be here. And this place, like King's Canyon, has a certain tranquility about it. Flies accepted. Uh, oh, okay, damn these flies, they're vicious bastards. <laughs> but when they leave you in peace for a few minutes, yeah, it, this it's, it's a rather tranquil place. I'm just hearing the crickets in the grass and the wind in the trees. And the rock that I'm sitting on is starting to really, really burn my ass. So, <laughs> on that note, <laughs> I think it's time to head back to the car. Oh, hot. <laughs> Well, it, uh, it makes me happy to know that these very special species of palms exist and that they're thriving in this valley. Only a few of them left, but 
they're thriving and long may they live So, just making my way slowly back, back up to the top. What a beautiful place though. And this is made all the more special by the difficulty in getting here. Now I need to decide where I'm going to camp tonight. It's now 3.30. How are you going? You guys right? Okay. You guys okay? Oh, yeah. Why are we going to go to the starting from walking because we're not very confident. Oh. Okay, it's it's a fair walk. It's a fair walk. Yeah. No. Okay, you've got water? Yep. Yeah. Okay, good luck. <laughs> bye bye. So those two young people were walking from the picnic spot down to Palm Valley which is about four kilometers there another four kilometers back I don't know if you heard that but they uh, they were saying that they're not very confident four-wheel drivers which is why they're going to walk now it's uh, about 36 degrees and I only saw them have one water bottle so I hope that they had I hope the guy in his backpack had more water because you know the, the two of them with only one small water bottle like that going eight kilometers in this heat I uh, just I just hope that uh, they'll be fine uh, here's the campground look at this so all dingoes are scavenging in this campground items recently lost to dingoes camping chair sleeping bag dishwashing liquid many rubbish pans bags cup noodles food you can keep dingoes wild and people safe by securely storing food and rubbish leave campsite tidy not encouraging or attracting dingoes remain alert during meal times or when preparing food if dingoes feel too comfortable here they may become aggressive yes that is true though dingoes will become aggressive if you feed them and then one day you don't give them food so that's a very good point never ever ever feed wild animals including dingoes because they will become reliant on having been given food and then one day if somebody comes here camping or walking through and doesn't give them food then they will get aggressive whereas if you never give them food then they're not going to expect food from you and there's no reason for them to become aggressive oh what a gorgeous camping spot what a beautiful spot why not why are I staying here tonight? Maybe I should. Maybe I should. This is beautiful. You know, one thing that really pisses me off is yes, this place is remote, but you come all this way and you find the most idyllic camping spot and there's a sign out saying you have to book ahead first and of course there's no mobile phone reception and then I, I go and find a sign and the sign says uh, there's a mobile phone hotspot but that is a five kilometer walk away from the actual campground and after a five kilometer walk then there's another 150 metre walk to where the hotspot is. I mean, how many of you plan out your trips hour by hour, day to day? I don't. I've got a rough idea of generally the things that I would like to see on a trip, but 
I don't stick to it like glue. If I find something better to do along the way, I do that instead. So still no mobile phone reception. Now I can see that there's some permanent tents set up here in the National Park. Of course I've got my own tent. Ah, here we go. I think this is where the mobile phone hotspot is because I can see a pole with a satellite dish on top of it. I'm recording this on my mobile phone by the way, so if it's a little bit shaky, I apologise for that. Okay, here we go. Let's see this hotspot work. Okay, so at long last, I managed to make a booking. So I had to put my phone on a pole about 30 centimetres from the middle of a satellite dish. That's the only place that they can organise to have mobile phone coverage. I had to visit the website and then I had to become a member, I had to register my details and uh, wait for the email to come back and confirm it. You know, the usual process. Except when you've got a very, very slow, barely functioning uh, signal out in the middle of nowhere and it's, you're standing in a 36 degree heat. Uh, it's not much fun. But I managed to register and book a spot. So now I'm gonna head back to the campsite and chill out. Well, I finally managed to book a camping spot at the Wi-Fi hotspot. And now I'm just relaxing. Beautiful spot, tent set up in 30 seconds really. I'm just doing my nightly ritual of uploading the the footage to from all the cameras, all the cameras here to the external hard drive. I'm thawing out some chicken, which is going to be for dinner tonight. There's my induction cooktop, and uh, it's my side-out kitchen, which works a treat. I might show you that a little bit later on. Here's some entertainment for later on. That entertainment has already been had. And uh, now there's nothing left except to enjoy this beautiful view. Look at that. That's just a magical view. So that's going to change colours as the sun sets, so I'm looking forward to that. And now I've got my chair, I'm going to put my feet up. Cheerio folks. I had a wonderful night last night camping out in the Fenk Gorge National Park. Uh, there's only one little camping spot and there were about 20 other vehicles in that camping spot though, but the, everyone was quite spread out and it was very nice. As soon as everybody went to bed, the dingoes came out, making these eerie howling sounds. It was really cool. Luckily the dingoes left us alone. A few people, I heard a few people get up and hurriedly start packing away food and, and uh, chairs and things that they had left outside because dingoes are known to occasionally steal whatever they can get. So uh, apart from that it was a wonderful night, nice and warm and this morning I've packed up and I'm heading back. I've made it out of the National Park and now all I need to do is reinflate my tyres and head back home. So that is the end of uh, this series. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I really enjoyed making it and uh, thank you so much for watching till the very end. It really means the world to me and if you like it, 
I'm so super happy about that. So uh, until the next video, take care guys. See you later, bye bye. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed this video, consider supporting this channel. You can buy me a coffee or make a small donation at ko-fi.com slash forexadventures. You can also find us on our website forexadventures.com.au and you can connect with us on Instagram via forexadventures underscore Australia. Your support means the world to us, so thank you once again for watching.